Good evening and welcome to Gibson's Bookstore Remote. I am Elizabeth, the events coordinator for Gibson's Bookstore, and I am pleased to welcome on her launch day event a frequent customer at the bookstore, a frequent face. We were very pleased to be able to celebrate her tonight, Sarah McCraw Crow, with her novel, The Wrong <laughs> the wrong kind of woman and she is joined in conversation by fellow novelist Amy Meyerson whose recent most recent book is The Imperfects. Sarah, happy launch day. Congratulations. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for hosting this. It's very exciting. It's been a long road to get here but thank you. And Amy, thank you for joining us as well. Yeah, of course. It's my pleasure. I mean one of the uh good things about having all of these events be remote is that we don't have to, I mean, it's really nice to be in person, but that we can do things across the country. And I'm really excited to help Sarah launch her book because I'm a very big fan of it. Thank you, Amy. Well, so I'm going to hand it over to the two of you, um, Amy, Sarah, uh, the, the books are available from Gibson's bookstore. Sarah is signing copies. She's, we actually sold our first shipment of the book out and Sarah is, coming in. We, we have more books coming in. Sarah's going to come sign them. And then Amy's book, we do have signed book plates that we are happy to include with any purchase of Amy's books from Gibson's Bookstore. Take it away, Amy and Sarah. Great, Sarah. Well, uh, thank you so much for letting me join you for your launch. It's very exciting for me. Uh, how's, you know, before we start, how's your day going? Um, how does this, I'm sure it's a little different than you have imagined probably for years that your launch would go. Yeah, it's, I actually feel very celebrated. There's been a lot of screen time today, I would say. Um, so I hadn't really pictured that. But, you know, we've been in this weird year and pandemic for a while now. So I knew this was coming. And I don't know, it feels pretty good. Good. Well, it should. Um, it's a little like, a. I always, I found like my first launch, it, it feels like your birthday when you're a kid, kind of. It's yes. like the, the best best way to describe it. Um, so I, you know, I want to talk about this book in this moment and I have some other questions, but I, I thought before we get started with questions, it's always nice to hear from the author herself in terms of, uh, you know, what, what, how you describe your book and what you think it's about and what's important for readers to know diving in. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So my novel is about three characters who are all grieving the same person. And the three characters are Virginia, who's in her late 30s, and her daughter, Rebecca, who's almost 14, and a college student named Sam, who's musically talented, but uh, a very lonely guy. And they all have a connection to Oliver, who was Virginia's husband and Rebecca's dad and Sam's jazz bandmate. But the person who's really at the heart of the story is Virginia, because this novel is set in 1970 and 71. And there's sort of a background of the Vietnam War and student strikes and protests and the sort of beginnings of the second stage of the uh, women's movement. And Virginia finds purpose in new friendship with a group of women that her husband really didn't like. Um, the only I forgot to mention that this uh, Oliver was a history professor at Clarendon College, which is an all-male college, sort of loosely based on Dartmouth College. And when Virginia becomes friends with these women, she also starts to help them bring the women's movement to the college and their small town. And at that point, uh, sort of all hell broke, breaks loose, I would say. So I'll leave it there. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to... Right. I have questions about this, some things that happen in the second half of the book, but I'll have to ask you them independent of our event. <laughs> we don't want to spoil anything for readers. Um, so here's my, my first question. I was just wondering, you know, the, what, what really struck me at the heart of this novel was that um, it's, it's really a tale about grief and loss and um, it's very internal uh, experiences. And yet it's set to the, not even to the backdrop, but set really within all of this um, campus strife and as you mentioned like the Vietnam War and uh, the women's liberation movement. So I was wondering why you decided to juxtapose those two things to set this very sort of internal story amidst this this very uh, externally you know 
um, engaged period of history? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say at first it was not intentional. It was um, my, when I was first writing the pages of um, Virginia and Oliver, and I had a ton of pages in Oliver's perspective, which I had to let go of, but um, I was just curious about them and that time period, mainly because I'm curious about um, the people of my parents' generation and a little bit older. And the sort of chaos and change that was starting to come to come into the story, that sort of came to me a little bit later. But it, what I realized was for some people, you don't change or take action unless you have to. And one of the things that makes you have to sometimes is loss or grief or something that like jolts you out of your normal place. So if Virginia hadn't lost her husband, she certainly never would have become friends with Louise. She wouldn't have taken those first steps. So um, I can't say that I was thinking, hmm, it should be thematically interior and have this exterior stuff going on. It just kind of happened. Mm -hmm. And so what do you, but what do you think it brings <clears throat> to the story that would have been different if it did tell, you know, a longer period of, of Oliver and Virginia's lives? That's a good question because I did at first think that's how the novel would be, that it would be more a story of a marriage. Um, so there would be more of that, um, a longer passage of time. But I, I kind of wanted it a little bit compressed. I wanted to just have a short time frame for, for the story. And I wanted to write towards something. So I was writing towards the decision that the trustees were making. So I had that as an endpoint in mind. And um, it's, it's certainly more compressed than I originally thought it would be. But... Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really know. It's funny how some of these writing decisions aren't really decisions. They just kind of grow and grow and grow. And then you realize, oh, I'm going completely the wrong way. Or someone else reads pages and says, well, why don't you, what about this person? Or this character has to go. So. Yeah, I find there's also like serendipity in the decisions we make without realizing it that, <laughs> you know, you, you decided to compress the time and then it works so perfectly. And I think it works so perfectly for right now too. And, and the echoes of the political strife of the sixties and seventies now. Um, and, and then sometimes those things work out kind of retrospectively and that it's not necessarily an active or an, a conscious decision. And I think right. that's one of the great things about, about books. Um, I was going to ask you a little later on, but I may as well ask you now since, since it started to, to come up about your process toward publication. And, um, you know, I had wondered if you'd always started with Oliver's death. I don't think that that's spoiling anything because it's literally the first sentence mm -hmm. of the book. Um, but it was such, it worked so well as the starting point, particularly with what you were just saying about people being forced to change. Um, so that's so interesting that uh, you had to, you went, that wasn't the initial vision for the book, even though it feels like just the perfect place to start it. Uh, were there other things that you had to cut or what was, you know, what was, how long have you been working on this book? What was your path toward bringing it out in the world? Oh yeah. Well, okay. There were many things I had to cut, including all those pages from Oliver's perspective. And um, I actually started writing this when I had a different novel out on submission. And I, I was just sort of noodling around for a long time, but it was, um, these characters just kept popping up and I kept, you know, spending time with Virginia. And then I don't remember exactly when Sam popped up, but he, I knew there was something in Oliver's past that he was feeling really bad about. And um, so Sam was sort of in the background, I guess. And then he came forward. And, and then at some point I had all these pages in the perspective of Elodie, who's a very secondary character. And those really weren't working, so I let those go. And so again, that's more like experimenting and, and so forth. But yeah, so the, I was writing that while a 
previous novel was out on submission and that never sold. <clears throat> and when that came to its end, Sharon, my agent, who's here tonight, hi Sharon, um, I, I told her I had this new thing and I sent it to her pretty soon after and she said, yeah, let's keep going with this. And so the whole process, three years sounds like a long time to work on a novel, but it seems like it went really quickly. It didn't seem, it was a um, pretty quick process, I would say. So that was three years before you were working with your agent before you sold it or three years total? Well, I started it in probably 2016 or 27, 2016. Yeah, I think it was around three years. And I, you know, I had time to take a couple of classes and did my MFA program um, with a lot, with those pages. And yeah, I, I think it was about three years. Interesting. So, um, yeah, I was really interested in the fact that you, uh, you have, so you have Virginia and Rebecca, who are both very obviously connected to Oliver as his wife and daughter. And then this third perspective, which I just loved Sam's character and his pages. And I found Elodie, even though she is a minor character in some ways, to have a major presence on the page. And I was interested in the fact that you, you chose to, to tell those scenes of like the campus life and uh, through Sam. How did his character come to you? Why did you think that was the right counterpoint? Or why did you decide to make that the counterpoint to an other I mean, he's, he's otherwise very, you know, mostly all the other characters whose voices or whose perspectives were in are female and it's a very female book. Yeah, and right. I mean, you could argue that that was like a crazy decision and especially because it's called the wrong kind of woman. But I, Sam, once I started writing him, I kind of couldn't stop writing his pages. I just really liked him as a character. And he came to symbolize somebody who's, he's sort of an insider. So he can give a perspective on the college that the other people can't, but he's also very much an outsider. He doesn't, he's in the wrong place. He doesn't really fit in. He's, um, I think he's a really lovely person and he's, and he's so lonely and, um, you know, he's grieving Oliver's loss too. And he wonders like, what does that mean? What does that say about him that he's, he's sad about that? So um, I just like the idea of him as an, you know, an outsider, somebody who really doesn't belong and he should belong. He should have been allowed to belong. Um, but also that not belonging allowed him to, you know, potentially get into a dangerous situation. Yeah, and I guess so. all of the characters in the book are really outsiders in a way, mm -hmm. um, particularly the the gang of four, um, who I, I thought it was really interesting, as you, as you said earlier, that, that Oliver didn't particularly like them. And so the sort of first way that we're introduced to these uh, female professors on campus is through, his, even though he's not on the page, kind of his perspective of them um, through Virginia. And so I, how, you know, you, you mentioned that you're really interested in kind of a generation above you, your parents' generation, but how did you land on these particular women and wanting to write about kind of the, the early female academics? Well, for starters, I wanted to have Virginia have somebody to kind of bang up against, it's like somebody she thought she didn't like, and then it turns out she was only, she was internalizing her husband's opinion. And I'm pretty sure that Oliver was just very jealous of, Lu of Louise because she was a better teacher and a better scholar. Um, so, and I, once I started to think about her, then I started to think about other potential faculty members and, um, for that time and that kind of school for women would have been a lot actually. And um, it was possible that one would have had tenure, like at Dartmouth there was a tenured woman professor in the 60s, um, but that was pretty unusual. So I was, I think I was probably too generous in having four of them, but I wanted her to have a group, like a different kind of group, but a group that she could, that she could be with. But I forgot what your question was. Was it? Um, gosh, I gotta forget how I phrased it. I just was curious, you know, how you, how you discovered these women and, you know, why you decided to write 
this particular gang of four and what drew what inspired you and drew you to them yeah well that part of it was just that exploration again but then they were definitely a path for virginia a different path but she wasn't the thing about virginia is she's rather traditional for a liberal or progressive person because she did go to grad school she was all but dissertation and that was pretty rare for that time but she's sort of in my mind she didn't have the confidence to finish or to really stand up and do what she needed to do and of course the culture was pushing back at her as well at that time so i wanted her to um get on that path and those friends were a way for her to get back on the path yeah well it seems like in addition to the culture her husband was kind of pushing back on yes her too yes um which i thought was really interesting that you know oliver does kind of represent the the old guard he's very much in line with the um perspective on female professors that that most of the university seems to have in the novel um and you know in, in life i would imagine um is that something that evolved what was your uh decision to kind of make oliver a point of you know even though he's not on the page a point of conflict in in terms of um you know he's married to she doesn't be she doesn't finish her dissertation but he marries a woman who's in 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 academia at that time right well, Oliver would, Oliver thinks that he's very progressive. Oliver thinks that he's like right out there on the front lines, basically, even though he's really more for the status quo and it bothers him when the status quo gets a little bit um, upset. So um, I think he went as far as he could go with his, with being progressive. And I think there's the other thing of marriage where you, you start out one way and then you slowly fall into different gender roles or patterns and um, some things you're not even aware that you're doing. So I think if you asked, if Oliver were a real person and you asked him, he would say, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm a very progressive guy. Yeah, so did, did you find that writing all those pages from his perspective, even though they didn't make them into the final draft really informed what was on the page? I think it gave me a good sense of um, of their marriage and Virginia's background and um, just like the, the frictions of a marriage and the things that you do and don't know. There are things that you might not know your, about your spouse, like little secrets or past things. So yeah, I, I mean, it gave, I don't know if that, I don't know how, if that translates to the page. I know that it gave me a fuller sense of, of him as a character and Virginia as a character and their life as a family with Rebecca. I hope it translated to the page. I but. definitely, I mean, I don't know what you wrote that's not that there, but they feel really fleshed out and their marriage feels complicated but it also feels like there was a lot of love there and you know some regret so for me as a reader it felt it, it felt like there was a lot of that work that that the reader never gets to see that's done by the writer in order to construct fully formed characters um yeah i mean i think you know i think it's so interesting reading this although i read this novel before the quarantine and 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 covid and I think I told you it really resonated with me because my grandmother was actually a professor at this time. That's I think right. by the seventies she had tenure at at, at Pitt, but I I'm pretty sure she was the only one around at that time, and it definitely created some complicated relationships, like with her kids and her husband and, and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. so it definitely really resonated with me. But it, it feels like, um, you know, it's it's funny as the wrong kind of woman because I really think it's like the right kind of book for right now, and and so much of this internal and external kind of mirrors uh, what's going on today. And so of course you couldn't have predicted when this novel would come out, but um, I'm just curious like what you think in other than an escape, particularly at this moment, how you kind of hope the book will resonate with readers or how you think it can be valuable with, you know, all the um, tumultuousness of- yes of life today and yeah. the quietness of life today too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, a few months ago, I think I probably, my answer probably would have been about, you know, 
we think with all the unrest and the protests and the political divisions, like, oh my God, we've never been this bad. And that probably is true. But the late 60s and early 70s were also, you know, crazily divided and, you know, student protests that with heavy handed responses and, you know, Nixon running on law and order and lots of parallels. But then more recently, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg died and people started reassessing all her work on gender equity, um, you know, things have changed so much since 1970 and all of that work that she's done. And certainly they've changed since the 40s and 50s and on. But I don't think that work is finished. And now I worry that we're going to go backwards. And um, so I guess now I'm thinking more in those terms of like, more specifically in terms of gender equity. But on the other hand, it's a novel. It's, it's not a lesson, so. Well, I yeah. think there's lots of lessons to novels. Uh, so I think, I think Ruth Bader Ginsburg would have liked The Gang of Four. <laughs> been friends with them if she knew them. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I think, how are we doing on time? I, I definitely want to, if you're up for it, want to do a lightning round in a little bit that, that isn't necessarily about the, the book, but more kind of generally about you as a writer. Um, but I guess, you know, I think you, you said it's, it's a novel, not a lesson, but I think there are a lot of lessons in these pages. And there's also a lot of really beautiful prose. Um, and it's, I, I'm, you know, so admire that this is your debut, although I, it sounds like you've, you've written some other stuff and um, before, but I guess one of the things we don't always get to answer that I think is an important question as a writer is, you know, what do you want readers to take away from the story? Well, what do I want them to take away? I want them to feel like my, that Virginia and Sam and Rebecca were, are real characters, that they feel like whole people to them and that, um, you know, the idea that our identities change when we're confronted with something hard, when we're forced by pressure, you can change and not always for the worse, you can change and grow in a good way. Um, but also the idea that change is hard and when people try to change things one way, there may be pushback against it. So um, I guess those are sort of lesson issues, lessons. Um, but yeah, I mean, I hope that they will just want to keep turning the pages. I mean, it is uh, a quiet novel in some ways. I mean, I think it's, there's a lot of interiority. Um, that's what I like to read and that's what I always write to excess, I know. Um, but I hope they're just characters that people will want to stay with for a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so who are some of your, your influences as a writer? Influences. I know the dreaded uh, question. <laughs> yes. You know who I really love and admire so much, but I, I mean, it's just, I mean, to even mention her name, I just love Marilyn Robinson. I can't get enough of her writing, whether it's Housekeeping or the Gilead books. And those are very interior and quiet. And she's just such a beautiful, plain writer. I just love writing that's like water, sort of. It's, it's not showy at all. Um, yeah, she's right up there. Um, I like that thinking of writing that's like water because I always talk, especially with students, about how I like writing that's transparent that you mm -hmm. kind of aren't bogged down by the experience of reading. But that's I may I may borrow that. <laughs> that's like that's good. Yeah, um, influences it's hard. I feel like I like so many different kinds of writers though, and but others you know I love anything by Kate Atkinson and she's more um, propulsive I guess, but also pretty interior. Um, I love Tessa Hadley. Um, Tessa Hadley to me is like if Alice Munro decided to write novels, that would be um, Tessa Hadley. Yeah, I'm sort of drawing a blank on other ones though. That's okay, I always, I, I felt, as soon as I asked the question, I felt kind of bad about it because I, I know I always draw a blank when people ask me about my influences, which is crazy because as writers, we love to read. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, I do think, I mean, there is a lot of interiority in this, in this novel, but there's also a lot of action, too. Um, so I can see on the page how, how you're drawn to, to both of those things. Are, 
I want to ask you like two more questions about, mm -hmm. about the book. Um, are there themes in this novel that you are interested in exploring in new ways in your future work? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I would like to, so the, the secondary character, Louise, who gets a few of her own pages, I really, I, you know, I'm not really sure why she just gets such a small amount of time on stage in the novel. And I really would like to explore her further. And I don't really know what her, what her theme is because she's somebody who's so guarded and um, defended, I guess. But um, so I guess I think more in terms of characters than themes, but you know, I do, I do like to think of, you know, something from a time period. So like we think of the sixties as all this change and that kind of thing. And um, so, I mean, I would, I would write more about that, about that period, but I'm not right now, so. Yeah, I thought that, that I, I thought the pages, I found Louise really interesting. Um, and I can see what you mean by guarded. She seemed like such a, she was forced into having sort of dual identities, right? The one that, that Oliver saw and the one that Virginia gets to see. Um, and I, I really loved how it seemed to me very organic that it, the few times it went into her perspective, it was because that was the perspective that it needed to be in. But I was very interested in the way that you wove, you know, I would say for me as a reader, Virginia, so it was certainly Virginia's story. And then secondary to that, I felt like I got Sam the most, um, and then Rebecca, and then obviously Louise. So I was wondering how you decided, I said I was gonna ask two questions, but maybe I'll ask three, because this was one of them. How you decided to go from one character's perspective to the next? Um, was there a system imposed after you had a draft, or was it totally organic? Um, at first it was organic. It was just writing, writing in the character's perspective and seeing what pops up. And then at some point there was a timeline and I knew that I had to stay within that timeline. And when I started to know what the characters were doing and where they would be together and where they would be apart, that kind of governed who was gonna pop up. And there were some things that I had to let go of because either the time didn't work or I had to put it in someone else's perspective. Um, yeah, that's the part that's much more revision-y when you're starting to see like, oh, this is, I think this is what the story is and um, this is where it's going and this is how long it's going to be. Yeah, so did a, did a lot of that happen with your agent or once you started working with your editor? It definitely happened with my agent and she helped me see what the novel was really about. And, um, we, and that was more a process of paring down, I think at that point. And, um, and also just losing some of the characters that are sort of like lost in their thoughts for pages. <laughs> I had a lot of that and backstory. I just love backstory and you know, how you can just get bogged down in backstory. So, yeah. And, and when did the, title become part of this novel? Well, the title. Um, so I have one of those, you know, those stories about titles where you come up with the list. So I think the working title, when I gave it to Sharon, was probably something very boring, like Westfield, which is the name of the town. Um, and that wasn't really working. And so we both brainstormed lists, and they were always like, that year at, or that woman, or that Clarendon year. And most of them were referencing like the place or the time, but they weren't really resonating. And when the novel sold, I think that was probably one of the first things that April said, my editor was, we wanna change the title. And so I started again with the, another list when we did all the brainstorming again. And I think we had, the Year of the Woman as a title. And actually that was maybe the title that's that sold. And so we kind of went round and round on that for a while. And at some point, I think April said to me, oh, we love the title that you that you finally picked or something like that. And, and then 
she said, it's the year of the woman. And I was like, that wasn't on my list. But so somebody at Mira came up with the year of the woman. And that was the one that seemed um, the best by far, even though it's, um, I mean, the wrong kind, did I say the year of the woman? The wrong kind of woman, because it raises more questions than any of the other titles. It's like, well, what is the wrong kind of woman? What is the right kind of woman? And who is this wrong kind of woman? Yeah, and it's it's definitely a question for both the novel and the era. That yes. Um, yeah, I didn't really, I'm gonna turn over to questions in a second and then we'll end with, with the lightning round. Mm -hmm. But uh, I didn't get to ask you much about it has such a strong sense of place. It makes sense to me that you started with a, with titles that were about place. Um, I mean, I know you said it's based off of Dartmouth and you live in, in New Hampshire, um, but why did you decide to set it, yeah, in, I guess, in, in New England, in New Hampshire in particular, as opposed to another? Um, well, I guess, you know, I, I do, I, I really love, um, I had a very good experience with Dartmouth at Dartmouth, but it was a place with a lot of um, complications and issues. But the setting is just so beautiful. And I was really happy to just spend time thinking about that setting and, or a setting similar, because it's not quite the same. It's uh, every, everything in the book is like slightly off to help me fictionalize it a little bit more. But um, yeah, and I wanted it to be not exactly a campus novel, but the thing about campus novels is they're like little bubbles and um, that was like a controllable setting that was fun to spend time in, I would say. Yeah. Um, well, some, oh, I see. Elizabeth, are you, are you chiming I'm in? I'm prepared, or I'm prepared. You said that was your last question, so I'm here and I'm ready, but you look like you oh, have another you, question. I I didn't, oh, are you gonna take over the Q&A part? I shall. Okay, well, one of them was a question that I was gonna ask Sarah too about her, her research process and you know, how, much, how much and what type of research did you do um, to make this feel as fully formed and informative and accurate as it is? Mm -hmm. Well, I did uh, a lot of different kinds of research. I mean, some of it was even things like just, um, getting familiar with late 60s music, which I sort of thought I knew, but just getting getting that down and listening to a lot of that and reading old newspapers and old magazines and uh, looking at the bestsellers and movies and things like that. And I mean, the, the, it was very helpful to read accounts from women who taught at New, Eng New England colleges at that time and women who were exchange students at Dartmouth before it went co-ed and um, talking to some of them and talking to women who went to women's colleges in the 40s and 50s, so just to get that sort of texture. Um, and there was a lot of, I read, there were kind of different books about the period, like revolutionaries that didn't, I didn't really need that much of it, but I just needed to know some basics, um, you know, of more radical people, like people who joined Weather Underground, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So Amy, you and I can alternate asking audience questions, but okay. I am going to jump on one that I saw from Wendy because it mimics one that I had written down here. I was going to ask, how often do characters surprise you? And Wendy says, I'm always interested when authors say the characters wrote themselves. Do you feel this is true in your writing? I especially wanted to ask this because you said you were pretty sure Oliver was jealous of Louise. So did he, I mean, who, who was, whose feet were on the, whose hands are on the wheel there? <laughs> well, you know, because Oliver is, doesn't really show up in the book except as a, in other people's memories that that's something that I know, but you know, no one else really, but yeah, no, I see what you're saying. Um, I mean, the characters don't write themselves, but they do you do end up with surprises with, with all of them. That, that always happens. There's things that either they say or they're thinking that all of a sudden you've written this thing and it wasn't really where you thought you were going. And I'm really inarticulate about that because I've seen that in short stories and stuff too. Um, but 
they definitely don't write themselves. Sometimes it's just, things are not coming and sometimes I'll be taking a walk and, you know, ask a question like, what would happen? And feel like it's, I'm never going to get the answer, but then the answer just comes. So I don't know. It's kind of a mystery. <laughs> Amy, do you want to pick the next one? Sure. Um, well, we can go. Well, since you're talking about taking a walk, uh, Tim asked about how uh, how many hours a day do you write on average while, or how many, or did you write on average while writing this novel? I might expand that a little bit to can you give us a little insight into your process and yeah, how much is active writing time versus walking time? Yeah. Um, well, I would say when I'm like when I was drafting this, I would say like a couple of hours first thing in the morning. And if I, did, if I didn't get to it first thing in the morning, I was probably not gonna get to it at all. And it has to be before Twitter, before the New York Times, you know, just straight to that. And usually in a notebook first and then in the laptop later. But yeah, there is a lot of passive writing time. And I know different writers say different things like writing is only writing if you're in the chair and with your computer. But I think there's things you discover when you're out taking a walk or taking a shower or um, doing something else completely that takes you a little bit further into the story. So, but yeah, I, I write, right now I'm not writing anything. I haven't really been able to write much during the pandemic times, but um, you know, a few hours a day is um, the most I ever do. Virginia actually does ask about that. She asks, um, she was wondering whether the last few months of COVID have helped you become more creative or whether you found it more challenging to write. Have your writing routines changed at all? I know that I have complete brain fog and my creative processes have just been crushed. How about you? Yes, there was definitely that thing at the beginning where it, all of a sudden, Nothing seemed to have any meaning at all. Like my words had no meaning and I, st I still sort of have that. But I will say that I was also finishing up a grad program at Vermont College of Fine Arts. So I had pages I needed to be turning in. So that did keep me going, but that was mostly revising and editing. Um, I don't know, I would love some tips. Virginia, put your tips in the chat bar because I, I don't know, I wanna get back to feeling like we're things are a little more normal and we can just keep writing. Yeah, well, I think it helps to remember like why, why you're reading. Um, that's something that's been helping me because I was having a lot of trouble at first writing too, because um, it feels like, you know, if you're just writing a story about a family, every, everybody's grappling with their own, but then that's, that's the connector, right? right. Um, so I've, I've been trying to pay not that you asked me, but I've been trying to pay a lot of attention to what I'm drawn to right now and, and what kind of escapes I'm looking for. And, and I think it's, you know, if, if our writing can, can create a similar escape for, for other people, that's important. It's true. And it is a good, it's a good time to read too. I have been reading a ton and that's, yeah. So Elizabeth asks, growing up when you did, how aware were you of the women's movement? Were the women who shaped your life involved? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would say that some of the women who shaped my life were involved and some were not. But um, I think like my mom was very busy with little kids and a husband who was a medical resident so or a surgical resident. So she was not doing any of that, but um, my two aunts were a lot more involved in the women's movement. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess the other thing I would say about that is my like five-year-old me or seven-year-old me, I think would be surprised that we aren't farther along. You know, in the early seventies, it seemed like things were changing so fast and doors were opening and, you know, it seems like we're really not there yet, so. Closer though. So we've had uh, several questions about backstory and the way that you crafted this. How did you make decisions to cut the backstory and related, um, 
Jessica wants to know what was the first scene that was your entry into the story. She particularly loved the scene set in Virginia with Virginia's mothers and sisters. But I think you mentioned that your first foray into the story didn't get kept. So how are there any scenes that you had to cut that you wish you could have kept? Yes, um, actually there were a lot. And, and as far as backstory getting, um, knowing when to cut backstory, a lot of times Sharon would just say something like you're um, it's dragging a little bit, it's like way too many pages here. So um, I think pretty much every reader I've ever had would say something like that. So, and I'm slowly learning to self edit, but um, so, oh, so in entry into the story was, as I mentioned, was more like Oliver and then Pages I wish I could have kept. I did have, this is also more backstory, but I had this little chapter about when, when Virginia and Oliver first meet and they're both grad students and uh, just sort of leading to the first time they sleep together. And I just thought, it's just so nice. And I had no place for it. And I threw it at the end of the novel as like a little epilogue. It didn't belong there either. And I think that was another time when Sharon said, you probably need to let that go. It's not helping at all. So, but I was just like, I was like so attached to it. I don't know why I was, but yeah, I was sad to let those go. Amy, do you ever have uh, scenes that you have to let go and how do you handle that? Oh, sure. I mean, I think, I think we all do. I, Sarah, I have the, I like backstory too. And, um, you know, I, I, I really trust, and it sounds like Sarah does too, I really trust both my agent and my, my editor. I mean, that's, that's why we work with them. Um, so it's usually it's, it's things I know that don't need to be there, but it's like those darlings that, that I want to hold on to. And then it, it takes someone else saying, you know, you should really cut this. Um, I find also, I don't know, Sarah, if you have this for me, I want to keep the parts that I worked the most on, like, if if they're like my uh, the imperfects I have there's still a prologue um but I also had an epilogue set in the past and I did so much research for it that I just out of like sheer stubbornness of or like wanting the gold star I just didn't want to let go of it because I, I did so I spent so much time doing all that research so those are ones that are are oh is she frozen little bit. Well, I'll move yeah. to the next question and we'll hope that she comes back. Laura asks, Amy talked about your beautiful prose and I agree about that. So <laughs> were you always good with words or do you feel like that's been a big effort? Did you start writing early? Well, I feel like I've always been sort of writing adjacent because I've, or writing nonfiction and working around books and magazines, but I'm not, I, I, guess I wrote when I was a little kid, but I don't have that story of, you know, I wrote my first novel when I was six, like that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like I'm a little bit of a slow learner having my debut novel at this age, but um, yeah, I love words. I mean, I'm mainly a reader. I, I think that's what most writers are. They're mainly readers. And that's what I would, would rather read than do just about anything else. Um, who, Virginia asks again, who do you share your writing with in the early drafts besides your agent or editor? Do you have a writer friend or maybe your husband or kids or do, just, do you just keep it for you? And then Lucy actually on that note asks, have your children read your book and what do they think? Uh, they, they have read it. They were very complimentary. I think they liked it. Um, and my first reader is usually uh, my friend Laura, who we were in a writer's group together for a long time, and now we trade pages. And I think she's here tonight. Um, and I have a couple of other people that I call on that I've either met through classes or conferences or um, you know, different parts of my writing background. And I mean, I don't really have a group per se right now. Yeah. For each of you, what's next? Do you have ideas for your next novel, even if you're not actively writing it? Or um, what feeds your writing projects? Amy, you go first, because you have a more interesting story. 
Um, well, I'm, I'm about, I think I calculated it in about a tenth of the way through my, my new novel, which is, uh, it's, I guess my like one half a sentence pitch is that it's a um, kind of murder mystery set on a family, a hundred year old family run vineyard. Um, but it's, it's about this family that has owned land in Santa Barbara County since before prohibition. And it kind of tells the story of the history of wine in America and also of this family and how decisions in the past have uh, affected the present. But so I've mostly been in the research stage, which has been interesting during COVID, but really I've gotten very lucky and I've been able to go, it's harvest season right now and I live in Southern California. So I got to go with a local winery to harvest grapes. And then um, there's some grapes if you do what's called a whole cluster fermentation that you still stomp by foot. So I got to uh, participate in a foot stomp, which was a crush, which was really fun. Um, I think for me, I'm always interested in, I, I start with, with a, an anecdote from history. Like I learned that, and I won't take up too much of everyone's time, but um, I learned that there was a lot of uh, legal wine being made during prohibition which I wasn't aware of, um, and a lot of grapes that were grown legally and not just for sacramental wine. So that kind of inspired me to learn more. I always like starting with those questions from history and finding pockets of history that, that I wanna learn about. So some people write about what they know. I like to write about what I want to know. Yeah. Um, well, for me, I'm at the very beginning of another project and I, not sure where it's going, but right now I have, it's set in the early 80s and I have a character who is um, a grown woman, a mom, and uh, I think she's a doctor, but she is obsessed with the possibility of nuclear war and she's driving her family crazy. So that's kind of all I have so far. It's, I don't know where it's going, so. But I also want to put in a plug for Amy's novel, The Imperfects, because she was just talking about history. And The Imperfects, which is right here, is set in now. It's contemporary, but it also manages to be a historical novel without really having any pages set in the past. It's this incredible feat that she has created. But it's also just a really great family story. Also about grief. Thanks. So I will. Um, Amy, I believe you mentioned a lightning round. Yeah, do we have so time? We do. I think we'll have that take us out here. I did want to remind folks that the uh, signed copies of Sarah's books are available from Gibson's Bookstore, and signed book plates are available for uh, inclusion with Amy's books from Gibson's Bookstore. Um, that's this. We'll have the lightning round be our ending here. Do you want to take take us out? Sure, and I will try to keep, sometimes it doesn't end up being so lightning, but I will, I will try to keep it that way. We have seven um, minutes. Go for it. Okay, great. So, uh, longhand or keyboard? Longhand at first, and then keyboard later. When, what decides the point of shift? It's like when I fill up a notebook and I think I have pages and pages and pages, and that notebook is full, and I start to write, and I get to the keyboard, and I realize, it wasn't really that many pages, but yeah, it's usually when I get to the end, it's more of like what's on, it's not what I've written, it's the form, you know, the, no, the notebook is full. Interesting, I can't write by hand. Uh, favorite word? Favorite word? To use in your writing. Oh, wow. Well, this is not a favorite word at all, but um, a friend who read an early draft found that I used the word exactly like 87 times or something. <laughs> I have some words that I just like use way too many times and you know how you, you don't see it at first. Yeah, I have, I call it, I do a butt draft, which is where <laughs> I just look for how many times I use the word butt. Um, <laughs> and when I told my editor that, she said that she's had to tell people to do drafts like that for so and really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, all these all these little fillers that yes are part of the way we are ticks that we that we think well so maybe that answers the next one but i was going to ask you what what one what your least favorite word is or one of your least favorite words um well if it's in my writing it's things like that that i just they they're they are they're filler words exactly and really and so um words that i just repeat over and over but i don't hate them i don't 
you know, they're fine as words. <laughs> okay. uh, favorite book as a teenager? Wow. Um, as a teenager. You know, I read a lot of Graham Greene when I was a teenager. I read, I read him sort of voraciously, and I'm not really sure why. Um, I think I had a kind of noir thing at the time. Um, yeah. Um, it's more sophisticated than what I was reading. As a well, teenager. I don't. I don't know what I was getting out of it. Well, I read. All, I read a lot of other like the Thorn Birds and sagas and things like that too. Um, what is a book that you wish you'd written? Oh, wow. So many books. Um, you know, there is a book by Alice McDermott called The Hours. I think that was her most recent one, maybe. And I just love the kind of weird structure of it and how it seemed to be about one thing, but then it's really about something else. I just think she's another like perfectly beautiful writer. And what is a guilty pleasure book that you've read or one that you don't usually admit that you've read and loved? Oh, oh I'm sure I have a lot of those. Um, I don't know if this is a guilty pleasure exactly, but it doesn't really fit in my wheelhouse. But there was a book that came out like a long time ago, maybe 15 years ago called London. And it was just this novel that went through the centuries and followed these English characters and I, I don't I think it was maybe not very good but I just I I thought it was the most fascinating thing I really loved it uh, so it's a book that you've pretended to have read but when other people are talking about it but you haven't actually read oh okay um yeah I've got a few of those too I um could never get through to the lighthouse Virginia Woolf or the the waves um, I love Mrs. Dalloway, but I could not, I've tried. Um, same with War and Peace, I've tried, could not get through it. Um, yeah, I'm sure there are a lot of those. We all have them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if maybe your book answers this question, uh, if you could travel back in time, what period would you go to? Oh, wow. Um, I would like to go back to 1970 and just kind of get the feeling and see what see what it's like back then but yeah I would go back to I mean there's so many time periods I would go back to but I don't think I'd want to stay very long yeah um, dip in get a sense of it yeah um so who would you say is the most influential person on your writing that you are not related to mm. wow um I guess it would be one of my writing teachers, but um, wow. I think it would have to be, mm, I think I have to give that some thought. I mean, I would say all of my writing teachers have given me some really great lessons about um, so many different aspects of writing and about being a writer. Um, but I'm not sure I could give it to just one because there are more than one. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I realized a lot of these questions, I haven't asked them in a while and I borrowed this from a friend who's, who sent it to me too, that a lot of them are like the most the least. And I don't know why it has to be such like black yeah. polarized thinking. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm more shades of gray at this point. Um, well, if you, how about we'll let's end with, with this one. Um, if you could invite three people to dinner, dead or alive, who would they be? <laughs> okay, I think I would have um, to dinner. Um, or cocktails, you know. Cocktail, okay. Well, Jane Austen, because she was smart and funny. Um, maybe Lori Colwyn. And... Wow, who would the third one be? I would say Michelle Obama, but I would be too scared. I mean, any any <laughs> famous people, I would be too. I would have to like be invisible because I wouldn't be able to get a word in. But I'd be curious to know what they might say to each other. I've been listening to Becoming an audiobook before, like as I fall asleep, and it it's very <sighs> comforting to listen yeah. to have Michelle Obama put me to sleep. 
to say. That's a really good idea. Yeah. Yeah, it makes you feel a little better about, about the world. Mm -hmm. We all need that. Well, I will ask one question. What is the last book you bought for the cover? For the cover? Um, you know, I bought recently, it might be here, the, a book called The Dearly Beloved by Carol Wall that came out last year. It's another pretty quiet novel, but set in like late 60s. Um, and the cover is not beautiful, but it... Um, it just struck me. It's got like a couple facing away and they're dressed very sort of 1950s-ish. Yeah. Amy, what about you? I don't know, you know, I was just thinking about the fact that since I started publishing, I don't really spontaneously buy books as much anymore. It's all books that I know about. Um, so, or that come to you. Yeah. Um, so I certainly buy a lot of books, but they're ones that um, I've been, I'm excited about. There's a lot of these, I call them like, I think of them as like the Riverhead covers that I really like, the mm -hmm. sort of abstract, yes, colored. Yeah, I like, find. yeah, like Britt Bennett. That's a, the yeah. Vanishing Half. That's a beautiful cover. Yeah. And the Mothers, too. And yeah, mm -hmm. so um, I love all of those covers and I'm really drawn to them. And I think other people are too, because I've seen yes. them from a lot of other publishers as well. Yeah. Well, thank you ladies for joining us this evening. Thank you to our audience at home. Both Sarah and Amy's books are available from Gibson's Bookstore. Sarah, congratulations on a successful launch day. Thank you. It's we been will, a lot of fun. We hope to see many more books from you. Amy, thank you for joining us this evening as our In Conversation partner. You did a wonderful job interviewing Sarah. And thank you to our viewers at home. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Bye.